Hello, I'm Diana Reif, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival. I'd like to welcome our speakers, audience and donors. If the past four to 18 months has taught us anything, it is that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter, and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or groundbreaking films or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in person, for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and a board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It is no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. I hope that you enjoy all the events and that they make you think and dream afresh. Good afternoon. My name is Walter Federowitz, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Charleston Literary Festival, welcome. The Literary Festival's opening event this morning was a virtual session that featured speakers from London, Paris, and Berlin discussing matters taking place in Nazi Germany, the Vatican, Argentina, and the Nuremberg trials. This session, the Charleston Gambit, while dealing with matters distant in time, feature speakers from Charleston and Columbia discussing a novel set in South Carolina with much of the action taking place within walking distance of the Satilli. The Charleston Gambit is an historical novel set in the 1780s and is based on historic facts and real characters providing us with a glimpse into the Revolutionary War in South Carolina. The centerpiece of the novel is an unlikely romance between a young Irish colonel and a female patriot. The author, Charleston resident Stuart Bennett, will discuss his research for the book and its Charleston background with acclaimed historian, radio host, and Columbia resident, Walter Edgar. Stuart Bennett grew up in California and notes that while growing up in the West Coast, the closest he got to the Revolutionary War in South Carolina, Revolutionary War in South Carolina, sorry, was watching Disney Swamp Fox series on television. Now, after this session's done, we're gonna ask who starred in that series, and you can raise your hand on that. After 20 years in England as an auctioneer and antiquarian bookseller, in 1988, Stuart moved to Charleston and began his exploration of South Carolina history. He began the research that led to the Charleston Gambit, his fourth novel in 2015 when he returned to Charleston with his native Charlestonian wife, Jenny Sumrall. Joining Stuart in conversation is Walter Edgar, who is universally recognized as the Dean of South Carolina Historians. Walter is a graduate of Davidson College and received his master's and doctorate degrees from the University of South Carolina. After active duty in the US Army, including service in Vietnam, Walter returned to USC and served as distinguished professor for 40 years, retiring in 2012. He has published several books about the state of South Carolina, including South Carolina History and South Carolina Encyclopedia. In recent years, he's become a well-known journalist and radio personality, known to most South Carolinians for his weekly radio show, Walter Edgar's Journal, 
which deals with historic and cultural topics, as well as the daily feature, South Carolina A to Z, both of which are broadcast on South Carolina Public Radio. So before stepping aside, I'd like to remind you to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices. So thank you, and now on to the program. Gentlemen. Well, Stuart, you are someone who's come to South Carolina. Uh, how did you get interested in South Carolina history, and particularly with the revolution? Well, I have to acknowledge what Walter Federowitz just announced, which was Walt Disney was to blame, and I watched every episode of that uh, Swamp Fox television program when I was a, uh, a wee tyke, and um, I think that probably inspired me. Um, and I w remained a historical nut, um, went through college, moved to England, became uh, a fine art auctioneer at Christie's where my speciality was antiquarian books. And I started collecting 18th century books, dealing in them, and uh, this gradually sort of built up on me. And when I came to South Carolina for the first time, to Charleston, um, it was sort of like, like paradise. It was um, you know, 18th century houses with palmetto trees outside, which had a kind of irresistible appeal to a native Southern California boy. The perfect place to have an antique bookshop, right? <laughs> that was the one thing that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, and I, I am grateful. Uh, there are a lot of things that I'm not happy about about the internet, but I'm grateful to the internet in that it's provided a worldwide forum. Uh, and So the bookstore didn't work, and then you decided to become a lawyer. I, I, I thought I had to get a job, and I went to Carolina Law School and took my degree in 1992, and uh, I think that uh, possibly a 42-year-old law school graduate didn't have quite the right appeal to Charlestonian law firms but I had a very nice offer in San Francisco, and I moved back to California, raised my son, and I'm grateful to my wife, Jenny, for bringing me back to Charleston. And when, when she did, uh, I had already written three novels on other topics, including one about the central character, or a central character in this novel, Lord Rawdon. Um, and I knew that Rawdon had been a British off officer stationed in South Carolina, that he, he actually came to uh, the American theater in 1774, participated in the battle at Bunker Hill, and was promoted through the ranks. I knew he'd been in South Carolina, uh, and that he had come with General Clinton's expeditionary force, which besieged Char Charleston in the spring of 1780. Um, I didn't know much beyond that, and so I dived right in. Well, um, you, you've got a picture of Rawdon on the front of your book, uh, and you also mentioned that uh, I did not mention him at all in my history of the revolution in South Carolina. <laughs> uh, and I, I assume this is the other, the young lady is Polly, you, your heroine. Um, The way that you have written, uh, it's actually a great South Carolina kind of tradition, and I think I'd like to start off with that, uh, in the tradition of William Gilmore Sims. Um, probably South Carolina's best known, certainly in the 19th century, greatest, uh, greatest writer. Um, and he was considered nationally very, very good. He wrote six novels based upon the revolution, his six revolutionary novels. And I did, I did write them down because I, I have read them all at one time or another. Um, but they've, they've become um, kind of rediscovered of, of late. And I will tell you, I've, I used his novels in, in researching the revolution because Sims had access to revolutionary documents. 
And when he mentions incidents, particularly in the back country and the way the war evolved or devolved or have the term you might want to, the cycle of violence between Tories uh, and partisans and patriots. Uh, Sims captured those stories, and so did you. Well, uh, I consider that high praise if I'm put in the same rank as, as William Gilmore Sims, or I'm, I'm happy to even be several ranks below, but in the, in the same, to, to be mentioned in the same sentence. Um, and of course, I, I read I did not read all of Sims' South Carolina novels. Um, I, I like Sims, but he, he's good in small doses. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, and and if, if folks, if you're not, consider, not familiar with the way Sims wrote, uh, he's in the style of James Fenimore Cooper. If, if you all had to read, I had to read The Last of the Mohicans when I was in high school. Well, things like, books like, uh, the Partisan, or The Forayers, or Jocelyn, uh, which is really the first of his revolutionary novels. Uh, it's very much in the same style as, as Cooper, and it's, they are very detailed. The local details are important. And that's, Stuart, that's what you've done in The Charleston Gambit. You have, you have those details, whether it's what's going on in a tavern, or what a gunsmith's shop might look like. You don't just say that Polly's daddy had a gun, and it was a gunsmith. You talk about the tools, the different weapons that would be in the shop. Incredible detail. Um, and even you, you get uh, down to earth of what was really going on in here with the occupation, the uh, British occupation of Charleston. Uh, and you have a very fascinating discussion of a Charleston bordello, which I think you might want to share with our audience. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny how that scene came almost all at once. Um, and the background for it is based on my career as an antiquarian bookseller. In the early 80s, I started to put aside um, what I consider to be low-life literature, all of it now very, very rare. Um, it was certainly, certainly had uh, good, brisk sales on, on its publication. And in fact, the, the period of the Charleston Gambit, the period, period of the American Revolution, was a, almost a high point in the freedom with which this kind of literature was published in, in London. Um, there was a man named Harris who for 10 or 12 years produced what he called rather, um, what should we say, um, euphemistically, a list of the Covent Garden ladies. Well, the list of the Covent Garden ladies gave you the exact locations, the exact descriptions, and the exact specialities of the women who were for hire in the area of Covent Garden. Um, and there were novels that were published. Uh, one of the ones that, that had stuck in my mind was by a man named George Alexander Stevens. It was called The Adventures of a Speculist. And he has a long account of a woman of, a t of, a woman of the town. And that all came together um, prompted by a very brief reference in John Peebles' diary. Uh, John Peebles was a, a British Army captain who was part of the siege of Charleston. He went back to New York with Clinton in June of 1780. And there's a reference, mo most of the Revolutionary War diarists don't talk about these things, but Peebles mentioned a, a, a lady in Newport, Rhode Island, of particular particularly fine and genteel appearance, who kept a house of pleasure to a much higher standard than usual. So I decided that it was time to, to write a uh, house of pleasure um, to a, a much higher standard outside Charleston, and it's there. And I found, as I was clattering away on the computer writing this scene, that there was a... <laughs> There was a, a ditty 
from a Patrick O'Brien novel. Probably somebody in this audience will be able to identify the novel, and I don't claim that I'll that I will quote it exactly, but it kept repeating itself in my head. It, it's, it's something that Jack Aubrey sings, and it goes something along the lines of, you ladies of lubricity who dwell in a bordello, hey, hey, ha, ha, he, he, ho, ho, I am your kind of fellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's that kind of detail that uh, for those of us who, who, de who know and love the history of South Carolina that are, that are, that are special. Uh, you just didn't say there was a body house uh, or whatever the appropriate term. I think bordello was, was certainly in use there. But the madam plays a, a role in helping our heroine uh, through some difficult times. Um, so anyway, uh, you've, got, you've got other wonderful details like that. But this, they're set, this love story and I think we might talk, you know, it, this is not a bodice ripper, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, it is a love story, and quite frankly, Polly, Polly the heroine, um, some of, sometimes her conduct is uh, a little bit, I'm not sure what her grandmother would have said, that she, if she went unchaperoned to a house uh, where everybody else there was a British officer, even though they were gentlemen, um, and he noted Lord Rodden, her, her love, reminded her it was okay, she could stay there unchaperoned because her door could be bolted from the inside. Um, it might do in the 21st century with certain TV programs, but I'm not sure how that would have gone on <laughs> in the 18th century. No doubt about it. She was, uh, I, I, uh, I think by 18th century standards, uh, Polly's behavior would have been considered on the wild side. Um, I made her something of a scholar, and I also um, took a bit of inspiration uh, from the story of Emily Geiger, mm -hmm. who, or possibly Geiger, mm -hmm. um, who uh, is said to have uh, stepped up when her father was too ill to carry a message from General Green to General Sumter, uh, just after uh, my character, Lord's, Lord Rawdon's, relieving the uh, Green siege of 96 um, in June of 1781. Emily Geiger, or Geiger, took um, the message from General Green and rode hell for leather across country and was caught by Lord Rawdon's men. Mm -hmm. And some of the accounts I've read suggest that she was even brought before Lord Rawdon himself. Lord Rawdon, being the gentleman that he was, had her locked in a room until he could get a respectable matron to come and search her. Mm -hmm. So while she was locked in the room, she ate the message. <laughs> Well, okay. and, and you, you self-corrected when you said Geiger instead of Geiger because in Lexington and Newberry County, Orangeburg County, the German settlements, uh, it's spelled G-E-I-G-E-R and every German would say it's supposed to be Geiger, but in the Carolina backcountry, it's the Geiger. Uh, they, they have their pronunciations just as Charlestonians have the way that they pronounce certain <laughs> names. Uh, but yes, she was, she was a, a genuine heroine, one of, of many... Uh, actual women who uh, were a great help to the Patriot cause. Uh, probably my favorite uh, Carolina heroine is a woman named Jane Black Thomas. Uh, she lived in Spartan District, and uh, since I'm over 60, I can say she was over 60 in, in 1781. That was considered to be old. Uh, and she was... Uh, the wife of the commander of the Spartan Regiment, who was in a prisoner of war in 96th District. And he got ill, and in those days, if a prisoner got ill, the word went out for a family or a friend to come help because the British weren't going to take care of an ill prisoner. So she went there, and one morning she heard some English officers' wives talking about they were going to uh, go on a raid into the Spartan District to ambush the Spartan Regiment, a partisan regiment. 
Well, this woman who was over 60 stole her horse, a horse, rode 50 miles through 50 miles of enemy occupied territory to warn the Spartan regiment, which then ambushed the British at the first battle of Cedar Springs. Now, I used to tell my classes, here is somebody who really actually finished her mission and warned uh, the Americans. Compare that with Paul Revere. You know, he was on a paved turnpike <laughs> and he, he only got halfway down saying the British are coming, the British are coming, the British are coming. I guess the difference is Longfellow wanted to have a famous forebear so he did the poem that we all had to memor memorize back in the fifth grade. But here's, some, you know, you mentioned Emily Giger, uh, Jane Black Thomas. There were a number of heroines because during the revolution in South Carolina, it affected everybody regardless of class or race or gender. Yeah. Yeah. And you deal with that pretty honestly. Well, I do, did my best. I, I also wanted, uh, maybe a little perversely, particularly in Charleston where Lord Rodden, to the extent that he's remembered at all, mm -hmm. is remembered with loathing um, as the man responsible for the hanging of Isaac Hain. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to show Rodden first, well, all right, before we, there, before we get know, some of, some, not just this audience, but we hope that this show is going to be on the, on the journal as well. Let's explain the hanging of Isaac Hayne. You and I know the story, sure. but not everybody might know that story. Sure. Um, Isaac Hayne was, was a patriot. Um, he was not present in Charleston when Charleston surrendered uh, to the British in, in May of 1780. Um, he was, at the time that the, the British were going around taking paroles um, and later subsequent to a proclamation by General Clinton, which oh. Walter, go ahead. Now, in the 18th century, parole was, if you were captured, uh, you, you would sign a document saying you would not take up, you would not fight the king and you go, you go home. Uh, so that, it's a lot different from the paroles we think of now, but that was a very common uh, military ta uh, practice in, in the 18th century. And the British gave parole initially to everybody who surrendered with Charleston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they revoked the parole of certain ones. And this is where Isaac gets caught. This is, this is where Isaac got caught because he, uh, when he came into Charleston that summer with his uh, family, sick with smallpox, uh, he, the British told him he would not be allowed to return home with medicine unless he swore allegiance to the King of England. So he signed the paper and returned home where most of his family died anyway. And uh, in 1781, when the Patriot forces were advancing into the Low Country and were no longer, there was no longer a kind of protective cordon around the area um, where Hain lived, which was near Jacksonboro. Um, Hain, Hain considered himself no longer bound by the terms of his, uh, terms of his agreement to uh, serve the king. And he uh, became colonel of a, Patriot Regiment, and there's some irony in the fact that he set off to try to capture um, another Patriot officer named Williamson, who had given his, given his parole in the back country and was thought to be giving information to the British. So Hayne went off to try to capture Williamson um, in the end, Hain himself was captured, and uh, he was hanged um, as a turncoat. Um, it was argued, he, he argued that he'd given a parole. The British argued that he had signed 
and signed a paper giving an oath of allegiance to the king, which made him a traitor, but they were also hanging people who had broken paroles. So it was also, the British argued, um, a fair tit for tat that Haynes should be hanged because the British, or the, sorry, the Americans had hanged the British officer, John Andre, um, the previous autumn, and that was another story to do with the treachery of Benedict Arnold, but uh, John Andre was caught as a spy, caught in plain clothes. Um, he was, in fact, on a mission for, for the British, and he was hanged. Um, so, Hain was a decent and honorable man, and there is a fair amount of discussion of this in the novel, um, but Hain was, Hain was imprisoned and then summarily hanged. Well, and of course, all of this in the, back, in the background, besides you mentioned the Americans had handled, had, excuse me, hanged uh, Andre, Major Andre. Uh, the British were beginning to have a lot of problems in South Carolina. They were losing control of the, a per, small perimeter outside of Charleston where folks like Francis Marion, Thomas Sumter, and Andrew Pickens were are pretty much operating at will. The British had some strong points at Camden, and by the way, Camden is, the town is a big part of your story. Uh, it was the major backcountry town, and actually one of the few real towns in the backcountry in the South, period. Uh, it was a major trading post uh, and a major British strong point. But so were places like Rocky Mount and of course the fort at, at, at 96. But beyond those British outposts, those strong points, um, the countryside belonged to the partisans. Um, back in the 1970s, there was a very interesting uh, little pamphlet put out during the South Carolina Tricentennial uh, that compared the Revolutionary War, the way the British misfought it, to the way the Americans were fighting in Vietnam. The Americans controlled the strong, strong points and they controlled everything during the day, but the, the night belonged to the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. uh, this was by an army major, and it's the first time people began to take a new look at the American Revolution in South Carolina. And today, in military history classes at West Point, in the Commander General Staff College out at Fort Leavenworth, the Battle of Cowpens is regularly taught as a significant, one of the most significant battles in military history. And uh, General Morgan, who commanded the, the American troops at Cowpens, was uh, a strategic innovator. It was an extraordinary battle. I, uh, I tell it from uh, the British point of view, Lord Rawdon wasn't present there, and I think of, of um, and he was a character I had written about and realized that I couldn't have all the characters I wanted to, all the historical characters I wanted to in my novel, so I took him out. But there was a major uh, Archibald MacArthur who was captured at, by the Americans at Cowpens and they paroled him. And uh, I think it was um, John Eager Howard who recorded the conversation mm -hmm. where where uh, the crusty old Major MacArthur said, uh, I was an officer before Tarleton was born, and the finest troops in the service have been sacrificed by that boy, <laughs> <laughs> referring to Bannister Tarleton. Yes, uh, and uh, I must say you give Tarleton his due. There, there are people who have tried to rescued Tarleton's reputation, and I don't understand why, but they have. Um, I, I, take, I take my cue uh, on Tarleton, and of course he's, he's basically caricatured in, in the Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, but there was a, a wonderful contemporary reference to him by the playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan, who was a member of Parliament at the time, and, um, and someone mentioned that Tarleton boasted 
that he'd killed more men and lain with more women than any other, any other soldier in the American Revolution. To which Sheridan replied, lain with. Lain with doesn't say it. Ravished is the word he should have used. Rapes, said Sheridan, are the relaxation of a murderer. Well, everybody is familiar with Tarleton and the, the Battle of the Waxhaws, Tarleton's Quarter, Tarleton's Massacre, uh, but before the fall of Charleston, he had been, actually been involved in a, a skirmish just outside of Charleston. Monk's before, Corner. Yes, at Monk's Corner, where he had done exactly the same thing. And ironically, James Ferguson, who would be killed at Kings Mountain, the British commander there, uh, had actually recommended that Tarleton be censured uh, for his conduct, the conduct of his men, and Cornwallis wouldn't have any part of it. Right. Ferguson also, uh, because there were three of Tarleton's men who had uh, assaulted, let's leave it at that, um, three, and in fact they were Tory women, uh, the nearby plantation. Yes, yes. And, La and Lady Jane Colleton, who was yeah. the wife of a British nobleman, uh, and there were Tory ladies there. Yes, they were and, uh, assaulted. And Ferguson uh, wanted, wanted those troopers of Tarleton's to be hanged, um, and that didn't happen either. I think they yeah. were... Well, let's, we could let's, go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you, you, you mentioned the movie, some of which was filmed down here, uh, but we don't need to get into that. We can spend a good part of the afternoon talking about Hollywood and history. Uh, but the, the novel opens with the siege of Charleston. So let's kind of walk our, our audience through, through the book. Well, my character, Polly Cooper, who is uh, on a, a trip from Camden with her father, to try to bring some fresh arms to uh, Polly's two brothers who are with the Patriot Army in the siege of Charleston. And they get news of the reinforcements that have just landed um, and taken up positions uh, east of the Cooper River. And uh, Polly's father says, we'll turn back. There's no, there's no hope of getting to Charleston. And Polly decides to run away um, because she has, she has the, the two rifles for her brothers in her saddlebags. Not her, they're not in her father's saddlebags, so she takes her horse and runs off to try to get to Lempriere's Bastion, which was the, the, the last major fortress east of the Cooper River by the where, where the Wando River comes in. And um, she th thinks she knows her way there. She thinks she can get there. And instead, she's taken prisoner by, by Lord Rawdon's men. Um, and so it all starts. Um, Rawdon allows her to proceed to Charleston uh, without the rifles for her brothers. And so she's present at the time that uh, that Charleston finally surrenders to General Clinton. Uh, and let's start, this, when you, she gets to, the, to Charleston and Charleston under siege, this is where I was fascinated with your detail of the description of, well, I was going to say what was like everyday life, except there wasn't much everyday life going on in Charleston but as the siege was reaching its end. And the dissension within American ranks. Uh, you remember she, the, she, was, she had stopped at Middleton Place, I believe, uh, and Mr. Middleton had said, well, if the governor had surrendered three months ago, we wouldn't be having all these problems. <laughs> That's right. Now. <laughs> uh, um, and the British, after, the, after Charleston fell, said that there were Americans giving them information on where uh, artillery batteries were uh, clearly 
there were some patriots in Charleston, but there were also a lot of folks who just uh, wanted business as usual and let's get this war over with. And uh, She has difficulty. She is a fiery patriot. Uh, and frankly, a couple of times when she sassed off to the British, I'm surprised that she did not receive uh, rough treatment. <laughs> Not necessarily ravishment, but uh, uh, she had a pretty sharp tongue on her. Well, so she should. She was a good patriot. <laughs> well, uh, she, she had, she's already had her first meeting with Lord Rawdon, and so uh, as the British begin to move out of Charleston into the back country, um, he ends up in Camden for a good part of his military tour in South Carolina. And of course, that's where her family home really is. Yeah. In Camden. Yeah. And uh, Rawdon, interestingly, and, and uh, I think that, that Walter, Walter referred to my pointing out that he did not mention Lord Rawdon in his book, Partisans in Redcoats. And, and one of the reasons that Rawdon gets such short shrift, I think, is that Rawdon was one of the comparatively few British officers in, in the backcountry who did not sort of wantonly uh, hang patriots. Uh, General Green, Nathaniel Green, who was the uh, commander of the Continental Army in the South, after Gates's, General Gates's uh, absolute and utter defeat at the Battle of Camden in August of 1780, when General Green came, came and took over in December 1780, Green sent a letter of complaint um, about the, the uh, seemingly random and unprovoked hangings uh, that were committed by and he mentioned Cornwallis, he mentioned Tarleton, he mentioned Colonel Turnbull, who commanded at Rocky Mount. Conspicuous by his absence was Lord Rawdon. Uh, and, and conspicuous by their absence was Rawdon's regiment called the Volunteers of Ireland, which was uh, not so much, they were, they were Irish, but they were substantially the regiment composed of uh, Irish deserters from George Washington's army at Valley Forge during that winter. And Rawdon turned them into a, uh, a fighting regiment which committed none of the uh, insults and outrages of Rawdon's, uh, of, sorry, of Tarleton's legion. Um, so, oddly enough, this makes Lord Rawdon a comparatively obscure figure. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't one of the bad guys. I mean, you had, you had Weems, you had Kruger, you had Tarleton, uh, and the Volunteers of Ireland that Rawdon commanded was a unit very much like the British Legion, which uh, Tarleton commanded. Made up, it was called the British Legion, but it was made up of uh, Tories. Yeah, they were mostly they, from Pennsylvania. Most of them, uh, most of them northern Tories. Most uh, notoriously, besides Tarleton, a Christian Huck, uh, who yeah. was in July, was uh, killed along with a hundred of his men uh, back in the back country. Yeah. Um, I, I describe uh, uh, there, there is a in the novel uh, a section about Huck, um, who was another one of the bad guys of the British, and I describe Huck in a, in a historical afterward at the very end as. Um, the chip off of Tarleton's block, but without the fancy manners. Uh, well, it was uh, the Battle of Huck's defeat uh, really was almost a turning point, particularly in, in the back country. Um, and that was just two months after the fall of Charleston. Yeah. And if, and if that weren't enough, yes. there was King's Mountain, yes. uh, where, where Ferguson, whom we just referred to, uh, was leading uh, a group of maybe 900 Tories and was completely annihilated uh, yes. by the Patriots. And this, was, this became 
major news in, in well, in Britain, yeah, King, King's Mountain, uh, of course, made Cornwallis change his entire plan for continuing further north because what the British had thought they were going to be doing was they'd already taken Savannah and Georgia. Uh, they take South Carolina, who they considered the jewel of the empire, and I need to remind our folks from Virginia, the richest colony in British North America was South Carolina. It was not those worn-out tobacco places up in Virginia. Uh, <laughs> And the idea was to roll up the southern colonies and then call it quits. And yes, there were actually, we don't have any concrete proof or, you know, there's no flame, no, no uh, smoking gun or document. But the French were seriously thinking about, you know, we've had enough. The war hasn't been won. Let's just, we'll just stop the war. Uh, and the Latin was phrase of you hold the territory that you now have. Right. And they said, if we got the southern colonies, we don't care about Pennsylvania and New York and certainly don't care about New England. But if we've got the southern colonies, um, you know, yeah. and after the battle of Camden, the first battle at Camden and Fishing Creek where Sumter got caught with his pants down, literally. Literally. Uh, <laughs> they thought, hey, this is a good time to, to float this idea. Right. And so right. that was always out there and then the tide turned, the tide turns, uh, partially thanks to Tarleton and the, his brutal behavior. Uh, there's one thing that uh, the Patriot gets right, because people ask me about it all the time. Um, and why were people fighting in the American Revolution? They were fighting the young Gabriel, who's supposedly Francis Marion's Son, and we know Francis Marion didn't have any children. That's one of the first issues. He was his nephew. <laughs> uh, he did have a nephew named Gabriel. Yeah. But the young boy who, who enlists because he, he's read the de Declaration and he believes in, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. He signs up to join the Continental Army because of that. His father does not until his son is killed and his plantation is, is burned. And that, those are the two reasons why people fought in South Carolina during the revolution. And that's one thing that the movie gets right. Sure, sure. Um, and it was a brutal, nasty war, uh, beginning with the wax saws and the massacre of American soldiers trying to surrender. Um, after Huck's defeat, his entire unit, there were not any survivors. The local accounts talk about, oh, a month later we found a couple of carcasses in the woods because those, those uh, British soldiers from the British, they were from the British Legion fleeing, were cut down and left to, bodies left to rot in the yeah. woods. There was, and there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of changing sides, which was why there became this, this kind of almost an epidemic of hangings um, because soldiers kept getting caught who had served with one army, deserted, joined the other army, been captured and discovered to have been deserters. And at one point towards the end of the war, uh, Nathaniel Green said, said he thought that probably most of his army was made up of British deserters and most, most of the, uh, the British army was made up of American deserters. Well, you know, uh Andrew Pickens is a case of, of, he, of he, switched, he switched sides and ended up on, obviously yep. on, on, yep. On, on the Patriot side. Uh, but after the Waxhaws in the back country, and the British complained about how the Americans had exaggerated what happened, and it was terrible all these stories that they, that they passed, but it, it didn't take but a few days literally for the word it, it, the massacre to spread throughout the back country of the two Carolinas. Right. Right. And in the 18th century, if you were surrendering, you asked for quarter. You know, those of us growing up, if you, if, when I was a kid, if you in a fight and you said uncle, that meant I'm giving up. Well, quarter meant I'm giving up and you surrender. Uh, well, Americans were asking for quarter. They were cut down. They were bayoneted. Uh, that's, 
one thing the British, they weren't wasting lead shooting soldiers. They, get, they used cavalry sabers and bayonets, and it was a really brutal. So in the back country, Americans would say, partisans would say, and the English were surrendering, we'll give you Tarleton's Quarter. Right, which meant you got bayoneted. Um, and, and you use another interesting term, the Georgia parole. <laughs> right, Georgia, the, the Georgia parole uh, meant that it was a different form of Tarleton's Quarter. You were simply shot summarily. Yeah. You didn't matter whether you'd surrendered, you got a Georgia parole. Yeah. Um, and part of, the, part of that, I mean, I think the saying may have come out of some of the, uh, the incidents uh, around Augusta. Yeah, um, it was, um, you know, if you try to, to sit, take yourself back in, to the 18th century, particularly if you are a woman with a family and your husband's gone off uh, to fight with, with Marion or Sumter, and they weren't doing it on a, you know, they didn't sign up for a year. They signed up when the, when the enemy was in the local area, so they, but then these are women on isolated homesteads, and what they went through uh, is pretty grim. Yeah. It's pretty grim. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in fact, the war in South Carolina, and these figures come from the uh, his, United States Army history official. In 1780, which is of course the crucial year you're talking about in, in the book, a thousand Americans died in uniform. 66% of those men who died in uniform died in South Carolina. And 2,000 Americans in uniform were wounded in action. 90% of those were in South Carolina. And in the last two years of fighting, which would take it into 1781, um, in the, you know, senseless death of John Lawrence and, and others. In the last two years of fighting, of all the Americans killed in action during the entire revolution, 18% of them were killed in those two years here in South Carolina. And 31% of all the Americans who were wounded in uniform during the entire revolution were wounded in this state in those two years alone. So the amount of death and suffering that took place in this state was was absolutely uh, and I think it's worth incredible. pointing out too that that all of those figures are the American side, and the Americans were giving at least as good as they got. Yeah. And by the time that Cornwallis, who described himself as I think I think having enough of his South Carolina adventures, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to have any more adventures south. <laughs> That's right. So he, he basically, uh, for want of a better term, he basically buggered off and went back up with this notion that he seemed to cling to, that he would simply sweep his way through North Carolina into Virginia um, and that, that he would be waving his flag and that young Tory men would be flocking to the banner and that he would... Um, sweep Virginia clean and that would be that and if, if the French had decided that they wanted a piece that was based on what, what the armies uh, held at that particular time well, as Walter said the British would keep the South, which was by far the most valuable territory to them it was the link to their Caribbean sugar colonies which they'd been losing to the French um, they, wa they would want those back and that would be the basis of the peace, and that those bloody-minded Yankees in, who'd, who'd started all the trouble in Massachusetts yeah. could have it. Yeah. Well, um, Yorktown, I mean, of course, where Cornwallis ended, ended up. Um, and one of my problems with a lot of history books, even those that are coming out today that had finally realized there was an American Revolution, uh, was that we all learned about Bunker, Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill, Saratoga, and then bing, there's Yorktown. <laughs> right. The war's over. Well, how did Cornwallis get? His army was destroyed 
pretty much in South Carolina, but both Carolinas, but especially in South Carolina. And those Tories he kept hoping were going to appear there. That's one of the complaints that Rawdon would make is that with every partisan success like Hook's plantation, Hook's defeat or Williamson's plantation, the Tories kept undercover. They didn't, they didn't sign up because they signed up. They had an X basically placed on their back and they were going to be right. killed. Right. And one of the things that I tried to do, and then I think we probably want to open it up to some questions, one of the things I tried to do in this, this novel was to show the other side that, that there was a British point of view which never really got much of a press because the victors tend to write the predominant histories. And if you read General Moultrie's, you know, the, the, as in Fort Moultrie, the victor of the Battle of 1776 at Sullivan's Island, if you read uh, Ramsey's history of the revolution in South Carolina, you get a picture of the, the Tories in South Carolina, uh, to use Ramsey's phrase, as unprincipled banditti, mm -hmm. um, ignorant unprincipled banditti. Well, they, they weren't. I was reading, I, I was reading accounts of, of um, a, a Tory colonel named Robert Gray who was clearly well-versed in his ancient history and referred to the patriots as goths and vandals. Um, there, there were just countless, uh, uh, well, they're not countless, because they, but the ones that have survived paint a different picture, and that's part of the picture that I want, wanted to try to convey here based, based on history. Well, a favorite tactic of both sides, because if, if they'll sometimes talk about Fort this and Fort that. Well, like Fort Mott, it basically was a plantation house that had a palisade around it. It was not Fort Apache from, <laughs> right. from the John Wayne movies. Uh, but frequently, it was just a, a, log, a log cabin or barn which had been added to, to sure. quote, make it a fort. Like Rocky Mountain? Yeah, and, and one of the ways, as happened with Rebecca Mott at, at Fort Mott, is you set it on fire, set the roof on fire to get people to come out. And whereas that ended in a nice surrender, frequently when a place was burning, as whether it was Tory or Patriot who was inside, as they came out, they were cut down. Sure, sure. Yeah. There, were, there, were, there were no prisoners. Or no prisoners. Um, if, um, if, any, if there are any questioners out there, we promise not to cut you down. <laughs> well, I, I really like the way you were able to use 18th century terminology uh, because I had an issue with terminology when I did Partisans and Redcoats in describing what happened to uh, Major Ferguson after the Battle of Kings Mountain. Uh, I used the term from, in my manuscript from British correspondence. Sure. The backcountry boys pissed on his, his, his body. Well, my editor up in New York said, uh, we can't use that term. And I said, I beg your pardon? She said, it's kind of crude. I said, well, it's, I don't think the backcountry boys pee-peed on Tom, <laughs> <laughs> rather on Ferguson. <laughs> I, I, won, I, I, won, I won that, that uh, particular, uh, because it was, and I, 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 cause I pointed out, and it was literally from British correspondence. Absolutely. They used it. Absolutely. Very, very proper term. Um, Stuart, it may be time for us to turn this over to the folks out there if they I have agree. any questions they would like to ask us. Please persevere, you know, potential questioners. Um, the mic will come to you even if we're not pointing. I don't know if you can see me or not, but I'm right, right here. I'm a Tar Heel and I know my Charleston restaurants better than I know my Charleston history. Uh, the Obstinate Daughter is one of my favorite restaurants uh, on Sullivan's Island. And I know a little of that story. I think there was a cartoon published in The Punch uh, dealing with the ferocity with which the British uh, encountered the colonials when they were trying to take Charleston by sea. 
Do you know anything about that story and how much of it is fact and how much of it is, is fiction? The, the, uh, you're referring to the, the Battle of Sullivan's Island in 1776. Yes, yes sir. Um, well, I, I... And the term was the obstinate daughter that was popular in oh, yes, Britain there, it, in describing it, it. Yeah, it was one of the, it, it was one of the uh, caricature prints that were produced and they were colored by hand and you could buy them for uh, sixpence or a shilling. And th that, was a, that was a particularly good one. Do you, do you know the one I'm referring to? Um, no, I'm but not. it's, it's uh, but essentially, it, the historical fact that it's based on uh, was the Battle of Sullivan's Island, which was uh, famously the attempt of the British Navy to uh, come into Charleston Harbor and take, take it at Fort Moultrie, um, which, had, which was made of palmetto logs, which absorbed the impact of the, the British naval gunfire, um, dealt pretty severe damage to the, the British fleet there was also supposed to be a kind of pincer movement by land forces coming from the Isle of Palms. And um, the General, General Clinton, who was commanding, was given, whether deliberately or not, um, false information about the depth of the channel, which mo many of you in the audience will know, that runs between Sullivan's Island and the Isle of Palms. So the British thought that they would be able to ford that channel in a, in a perfectly simple way and bring an attack on the other side of Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island. Unfortunately, they were, they, there were a number of British soldiers who were swept out to sea from the current and the depth of that little channel Just before like to, they gave up. Hey, look, sadly, one or two people every year, despite the signs, <laughs> it still try, happens. To try to cross at the inlet and but that's a part of the battle that's frequently forgotten, and that is Danger Thompson from Orangeburg and his boys had built uh, an impromptu barricade right there, and as the British were trying to cross the inlet, those boys with their backcountry rifles kept the British from that and the, the current in the inlet. Um, and, of course, the and battle the, at Sullivan's the, Island, June the 28th, a great victory for the Americans, and uh, it very much upset the, the British public because oh, yeah, and this they was lost, a, they lost two ships. That's right, and uh, this was a problem for the British throughout the American Revolution because there were these these backcountry and 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 low country boys, but they were they were shooting rifles which were accurate at um, distances that were twice. The, the range of accuracy of the British standard issue musket. So the, the Americans could basically stand off at a distance and pick off the British before the British could, could even basically bring their muskets to bear. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the case at, at King's Mountain as well. Right. Very weaponry was, was crucial and the sad irony for Major Ferguson, the British commander at Kings Mountain, he had actually invented a rifle for the British Army, but they didn't consider it gentlemanly to use that. It was never adapted at that point. So right. they were using muskets. The British Army was using muskets, and we were, our boys had rifles. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Hi. I'm over here. Back in the back. Other side. Over here. <laughs> Over here. Anyway, gotcha. um, I'd be interested to know um, how you approached your research. And related question, was there anything particularly surprising or interesting in that research which guided any part of the novel? The, the major part of the research was done in the impromptu fashion that as an antiquarian bookseller, I've done research for the last 40 years, which is I, I look around to see what I can find. Um, and then one thing leads to another. So with, with the basic research for the novel, I went to the contemporary accounts, which were um, uh, Bannister Tarleton, 
wrote an enormously self-serving account of the campaign in, in the Carolinas. It was published in 1787, and I rather suspect was largely ghost-written written, written by Tarleton's then mistress, Mary Robinson, who was a beautiful actress who'd been cast off by George IV when he was Prince of Wales. Um, but I digress. Um, what what the, the, the most surprising thing, because I didn't really know, even though I had come to be fond of Lord Rawdon in his later life, was the extent to which he got a bad press from American historians. Um, and the, the, to me, somewhat surprising extent to which even some American historians who were prepared to, um, let's say, cut Rodden a little bit of slack, were ignored. For example, I always found it surprising that, uh, that Lord Rodden's account of the hanging of Isaac Hain, which we referred to earlier, um, for which he is largely blamed. And in fact, when, when Rawdon was captured by a French privateer when he left, when he left Charleston in uh, August of 1781, uh, he was captured by a French privateer and delivered a prisoner to the Comte de Grasse, who was commanding the French fleet, which had bottled up Cornwallis at Yorktown. Well, the Americans wanted the French to deliver Lord Rawdon because they wanted to make an example of Rawdon in exchange for what they blamed Rawdon for, which was the hanging of Isaac Hain. Rawdon wrote a long letter vindicating himself to some degree, um, and it was uh, acknowledged by one of the writers of the period, of, of the later period, and, and also described as an able vindication um, by no less a soldier than Robert E. Lee in 1869. Um, so yeah. those were some surprises. Yeah, the, the real bad guy here, of course, is Balfour. It's of course Balfour. Who was, the way the command was set up, and they were both pulling out, this was a fight between two lieutenant colonels as to who was, who was really the, the guy in charge. And Cornwallis had left Balfour in charge of Charleston and that little perimeter and the rest of the state under uh, Rawdon's command. Hayne was in Charleston. It was Balfour exactly. who caused the, uh, the hanging of, of Isaac Hayne. I think, I think we're about to have the cut. Before I ask you to give them a round of applause, I want to remind, no, not yet, I want to remind you that they both have, have books to be signed in the back, and they both agreed to sign the book, so please patronize them, and now we can give them a round of applause.